Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of NBRI, New Business and Retail Insights, brought to you from the Center for Retail Studies, Mays Business School, Texas A&M University. I'm your host, Venki Schenker, Director of Research and Coleman Chair, Professor of Marketing. It is my pleasure to welcome our guest today, Dr. Katherine Tucker, the Sloan Distinguished Professor of Management, Professor of Marketing, and Chair of the MIT Sloan PhD program. Catherine's research interests lie in the intersection among marketing, economics, and law, in particular on how technology allows firms to use digital data and machine learning to improve performance and in the challenges this poses for regulation. Catherine has particular expertise in online advertising, digital health, social media, and electronic privacy. She's received an NSF career award for her work on digital privacy, the Erin Anderson Award for Emerging Female Marketing Scholar and Mentor, the Garfield Economic Impact Award for her work on electronic medical records, the Green Award for contributions to the practice of marketing research, the Odell Award for the most significant long-term con contribution to marketing, and the Inform Society for Marketing Science Long-Term Impact Award for long-run impact on marketing. She is a co-founder of MIT Crypto Economics Lab, which specializes in the application of blockchain and also a co-organizer of the Economics of Artificial Intelligence Initiative sponsored by the Sloan Foundation. Catherine has been a visiting fellow at All Souls College, Oxford. She has testified to Congress regarding her work on digital privacy and algorithms and presented her research to the OECD and ECJ. Tucker is co-editor at QME, Quantitative Marketing and Economics, Associate Editor at Management Science, Marketing Science, and the JMR, a Journal of Marketing Research, and a Research Associate at the NBER, our National Bureau of Economic Research. Catherine has received the Jamison Prize for Excellence in Teaching, as well as the Teacher of the Year Award at MIT Sloan. Catherine holds a PhD in Economics from the Stanford University. Thank you, Catherine, for joining me in this conversation today. How have you been this month? I've been great, though I'm beginning to wish that I haven't had, had such a long bio on my website. Um, that was quite embarrassing, but thank you for reading it all. But I, I'm doing fine. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. But you are richly deserving. All those honors are uh, really a testimony for all the great work you've been doing. Um, so far, I've had a chance to you know, read out your ac accomplishments, but I'd like you to describe yourself maybe in five words or less. What would be some of the adjectives that you would like to use to describe yourself? So I'm going to use five words for my research. Cool. Which is research focused on bad marketing. Oh, good. Because I think what's one, one of the wonderful things, I'll explain that. I think one of the wonderful things about being a professor is that generally in business, we have to focus on trying to give a positive spin to everything. But right. the way I look at one of the benefits you have of being a professor in marketing is you can both look at what marketing doesn't work, it's not helpful for society. And so it maybe wasn't the most elegant five words, but that's what I was trying to capture. That's nice. Thank you. And uh, we know that you uh, have traveled a long path. You started in economics and came to marketing. Please tell us a little bit about your research journey, some of the twists and turns that you experienced, and where are you right now? Well, if we have any researchers or young researchers who are trying to work out what to do, I'll, I'll tell my story just because it's perhaps reassuring that you will have a better idea of what you're doing than I did. So um, I grew up in England. I did a bachelor's in uh, politics, philosophy, and economics. Right. It's a wonderful degree, but it sets you up very well to talk at dinner parties. And I didn't learn any math. And then I come to, came to do a PhD in economics in America, and it was all math. And I felt... Oh defeated I must admit so if you ever go through that experience it's natural but you know what I found is that over time um, 
I, you know, and I wasn't sure at that point if I was going to be an academic or not. I sort of thought I'd be one of those people who ended up not as an academic. But then my advisors encouraged me to apply to um, academic jobs in business schools. Um, they thought I should be a strategy professor because I was studying network effects. Okay. Um, network effects were sort of very cool around 2005 and it was all about the Microsoft antitrust case and so many things happening. And it was very strategy, they felt. And I sent one application into marketing uh, that was in, uh, at MIT. And you know, I went there and I just loved it. I loved the people. I loved what they were studying. I loved how excited they were about what I was doing. I'd always had this bad stereotype that marketing was about studying people buying yogurt in supermarkets. <laughs> That's, you know, because at the time, a lot of marketing professors were focusing on the revolution in scanner data which was quite new and people were very excited about that. But then I went there and being a little bit more technology minded or interested in economics and technology seemed to make sense of marketing. And so that's how I ended up as a marketing professor. And I'm always grateful for all the, sort of the, the not quite obviousness of the path, if that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. So from yogurt and coffee to technology and public policy, that's very interesting. So how did you get used to that? high math that you weren't expecting when you did the PhD program at Stanford? How did you start uh, adjusting? I wish I had a better answer. I actually made myself happy by planning my wedding. I spent <laughs> two and a half years planning my wedding in intricate detail. There's never been such wedding planning that's ever taken place. And I think, you know, what I learned is that I had never studied econometrics before. I really had literally never studied econometrics and suddenly we were doing advanced econometrics and I didn't even understand anything that was going on. And then what was strange is that nowadays all I do is econometrics and I do want to emphasize there's such a learning by doing aspect to this process and that you learn these very abstract concepts at the beginning of your PhD. Right. And I think what actually transitions you be to being a good researcher is if you can take these abstract con concepts such as what endogeneity is and then actually think about how to use them in the field that makes a big difference right. otherwise you know sometimes uh those things you may struggle with the abstract the real test of the researcher is can you apply it in the field that, that's what i'm trying to say if there's anyone listening to their struggling with the math in their early career right but you're being uh, very modest in here because you've done some remarkable work on uh, uh, experiments, particularly causal inference and so on. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some of your substantive work. What are some of the uh, areas of research that you're working on these days that's really exciting you? So I would say there are three, I think it's fair to say there are three areas. Um, but they're all reflecting really the idea of does a world of data and data intensive marketing reinforce inequality or can it be a tool for good? That's the Very big good. If I was asked what my big thing is, it's all about inequality in marketing, um, whether or not uh, marketing itself can reinforce social inequality and so on. Now, practically, you can have this big vision, um, but you often end up just studying technologies. So, um, you know, at the moment, I'm very interested in machine learning and what reinforcement means. I'm interested too in just trying to understand the use case of blockchain within marketing. And I'm also interested in just this idea of what kind of advantage data gives you in a world of ubiquitous data. Is there really anything there beyond right. the fact that data is everywhere? So that's yeah. a subject, but that's sort of, that's, um, you know, it's difficult when you've, you know, you're trying to have these big ideas and then they, the thing about being an academic is you have these big ideas and then they all become small little projects. And then your right. head makes sense. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, but 
like you, you, you want the big thing and then you have smaller projects to build up knowledge. Right, but that's how you collectively build the knowledge. But I'm stuck by your efforts to combine different areas of research and try to put them together very nicely. Let's talk about them one by one, maybe unpack them. So let's talk about your work. You talk about uh, equality or inequity, addressing that using data or technology. Uh, can we use it more effectively and correctly to uh, move towards a more fair and just society? Um, you have uh, a bunch of work on algorithmic bias. Uh, tell us something about what you found uh, in some of your papers there. That'll be very useful for us to know which direction we should be headed. Right, so with algorithmic bias, it's been a big interest in computer science. And I think right. part of the background is that data privacy, which is something I've always been interested in, it's difficult to get a grip on. But when algorithms appear to do bad things to socially disadvantaged groups, we can recognize that that's not somewhere we want our society necessarily be heading. And so what I've done, which is slightly different from the rest of the literature, is to really take all that we know about marketing and how ad tech platforms work, to really try and unpack why do these algorithms sometimes give us these results that we feel uncomfortable about? Why is it they may choose not to show uh, ads about jobs in engineering to women? Why is it they may choose um, to show ads in a different way to spending on whether the area you're living in has a historic pattern of racism? And what we have an advantage of in marketing is that we can actually run and understand advertising campaigns and get real insight to the inner workings. And often in computer science, they're doing these big scraping exercises, but basically looking for the outside. And so, you know, we can have a good, good opportunity in marketing. But I think that the, um, the other thing to sort of say about it is that marketing has been, or advertising, has really been a front runner in adopting algorithms and machine learning. We've just been out there. Uh, you know, whatever people might have, their stereotype of marketing, or mad men. No, marketing's really so much algorithms now. And so it's also a useful test case for thinking more broadly, well, what happens when algorithms are more broadly deployed in like making decisions about people's finances or jobs or education or health? And marketing is quite a useful test case for that because perhaps in some sense the stakes are lower, but we can see the things that go wrong. So that's the general idea there. Right. So you did uh, one of the studies in which you did some nice field experiments and found our natural experiments and found out that ads that had the STEM uh, related jobs uh, were, you know, systematically not served to women, right? Uh, that, tell us something about, uh, you know, that, that study and its results. Yes, so what, um, it, what the study was really quite grand in its ambition in that we ran um, an ad uh, for a beautiful website that was helping women into careers in STEM right. um, across 190 countries. And our idea actually initially was to see whether or not the algorithm picked up the degree of uh, discrimination against women in that particular country. But you know what? That wasn't what we found. Really, the ad was shown pretty equally to women in, you know, in, you know, in countries with lower incomes with a history of discrimination. The worst country was actually Canada. Wow. Canada, that's, you know, for example, a country like Canada, women were really not seeing the ad. And then we realized there was a different explanation, which is really that female eyeballs are just expensive. And the mm. algorithm was simply trying to save us money by not Because sure. of the optimization algorithm, right? So that came in between, right? From Sorry? Sorry, the optimization algorithm oh, prevented yeah. them from seeing it, right? That's exactly right, because the optimization algorithm was behaving exactly like you might want one to behave your advertising. It was trying to save you money. It was saying, we can find you cheaper eyeballs. They just happen to be male. 
So as a consequence, in Canada, where female eyeballs, so many firms were bidding them up, you know, trying to sell people handbags, children's items, vacations, all the kind of purchasing decisions women are traditionally viewed as being in charge of, their eyeballs were just way more expensive than the men. And so the ad algorithm said, we're going to save you money, just show it to the men as you didn't tell us to show it to the women. So what can marketers do to avoid this bias going forward? What are some of the ways that uh, uh, both marketers as well as public policy officials can make the right decisions? Right. In my experience, far too often people, you know, running these big campaigns on ad platforms such as Facebook and Google, and they're not necessarily then going back and pulling out the data to see who was actually seeing their ad in the end. And the nice thing about both somewhere like Google and Facebook, you can pull out that data quite easily. And look, for many products, it might not be a concern particularly. But, you know, let's imagine, for example, you're in higher education and you're trying to promote what, you know, let's imagine that we're trying to promote what the retail center at Mays University is doing, at Mays Business School is doing. Then we want to be careful of these things, right? We don't want... Well, you know, we want it to be shown around the country. We want it to be shown equally to men and women. We don't want there to be a particular age profile. And so for these things where your aim is to have a very broad and expansive um, base, yeah, I think you can't just assume the ad algorithm is going to find it. Because yeah. remember, ad algorithm is constantly trying to iterate to find the most efficient audience for you. Right. That, by its very nature, means they're going to all look the same. Good. So they have to make some conscious efforts, maybe some make some changes in the algorithm and uh, maybe intervene if they find that they're not uh, following the ideal, right? Yes, I think okay. so, right? I mean, in the same way as, you know, Mays Business School would not consciously just place ads in, say, a sports fishing magazine. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you can't yeah. assume that, 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 you know, you're not going to get a similar audience by accident on an app, you know, a big ad platform. So, you know, make the kind of checks that you Practice. wouldn't apply well, perhaps. That's a, uh, yeah, let me, let me just make a segue to your other new piece of research that you seem to be working on, which is blockchain. One of the promise of blockchain is it's, uh, it brings transparency and democracy. So you, do you think com combining blockchain technology to uh, marketing and advertising would bring about uh, more fairness and uh, equity? You know, so I am less optimistic. Okay. Some other people. And this is something I've written about, uh, you know, because blockchain works wonderfully as a technology if we can have a completely closed loop. Right. Everything is digital. But one of our problems in marketing is it's hard to get completely that closed loop, right? The reason the retailing center exists is because, you know, there's loops which happen offline and there are other loops. Right. And so, you know, there was, um, back in 2017-18, there was a period where just putting the word blockchain near your company yeah. <laughs> to amazing amounts of money. And I think sometimes that happened in some of the advertising and marketing startups in that it wasn't clear to me why there was this use case for market, for block, using blockchain. Because like, think about what blockchain is really good for. It's really good for having data integrity. It's right. for making sure that no one's defrauded you or someone's doing bad. Right. Bad. And so... So that is more suitable, Catherine, for payment technologies, uh, perhaps, because where there you have more transparency and you have fraud prevention, and so it'll be more useful there. Is that your view as well? That's my view too. I mean, I don't think it's a surprise that the first and most prevalent use case has been digital currency. That yeah. makes sense. Um, and I think in marketing, what we need to think about if we want to use it is which of our interactions do we really need 
a long immutable record of what's mm -hmm. happened in the past. And for that, we'll probably, you might, we might end up in a world where it's less advertising and more things about supplier and channel relationships. But we'll have to see. But I think it's just, we had this great exercise at MIT where we got MBA students to look at a lot of blockchain startups and answer the question, did this blockchain startup need blockchain? <laughs> <laughs> and what do you find? Yeah, uh, it was certainly less than a third. Right. So I, I understand that the shiny object uh, the last few years has been blockchain and everybody has been trying to use it in some way or the other. And you bring a very realistic picture in terms of going forward. You mentioned that uh, in an ideal world, there may be less of advertising and more of supply chain and channel, uh, some kind of a matching of customer preferences, needs and wants. But let's also keep in mind the proliferation of technologies such as smart speakers, wearables, IoT and so on, which is also uh, trying to create a number of uh, connections and communications. Uh, although you may not call this advertising, but what, where do you think this is headed? Are we going to be in a world where as consumers are proliferated with all these technologies and uh, assistance devices or assisted devices, uh, how, do, how does marketing change in this environment? And how, how, does it, how do we make sure marketing is fair in that world? Um, so I think the first thing to say is we sometimes talk about proliferation as though it's bad, but I like proliferation. Okay. That what leads to um, multiple firms having access to the similar data mm -hmm. and us not going back to a 1990s world of, um, you know, one firm controlling lots, you know, the, the, the operating system for most electronic devices. So I'm, I'm actually, number one, I'm happy with proliferation for that. Yeah. Um, I think as of yet, we are waiting, you know, obviously there's this first use case of recommendations. The evidence there at the moment is somewhat mixed because I think people worry about echo chamber effects that it's going to mean, mean that you'll buy tied forever. Like most right. people tied forever, but really right. buy tied forever because you'll never hear if there's a better laundry detergent. But that's the tide is changing so far as part of the pun, because, you know, if, uh, during the pandemic, at least what we heard is that when uh, the, uh, grocery stores ran out of uh, some of these big brand names, they were, selling the store brands and uh you know if you used uh, alexa or google home to order it might have ordered first time around whatever is available and it kept repeating it so there may be some changes happening there catherine you know i agree because the one thing i would say is though the echo chambers are such you know such a topic for discussion when it comes to politics and what news you're consuming well, i've looked for product echo chambers in, in marketing, and we, we're like, we can't even create them. We try really hard, but you know what? Most people are just bored of talking about products. <laughs> and so trying to get any echo chamber where you're just gonna hear about Tide, we're not just eliciting the kind of preferences which lead to echo chambers. So I'm not even convinced that the first thing that most people are worrying about with um, smart devices is even a problem. So that's the good news. Um, you know, but it's interesting what you were saying about the pandemic and it changing so many habits. I'll just say as an aside, there's gonna be so much we, we're gonna learn, I think, when we look at these kind of shocks in retrospect, right? Right, so that brings another segue that I wanna to make to another research stream that you are now focusing on and publishing a number of papers, which is digital health, right? So the pandemic has uh, moved healthcare more digital. So what, is, what are some of your research in this area, if you want to summarize, and what are your key findings? Right, so most of my research in digital health has been about the spread of digital technologies and the interaction with privacy. 
And the basic idea here is that we often talk about worrying about privacy and advertising. But really, if you think about the relative harms, privacy and health is way up there. So it always seemed a good thing to focus on. Right. Right. Now, um, I think my most recent research I would highlight along these streams has been actually the take up of genetic medicine. Mm -hmm. There we were looking at uh, people who were having uh, a test for whether they had uh, the, a genetic mutation, which might lead them to be more likely to get um, a type of cancer like, like breast cancer. And we were seeing how that interacted with state privacy laws. Mm -hmm. What we found in general was some good support for the idea that the biggest you know, and best thing that regulators can do is to ensure that there's a sense of control. Mm -hmm among for the for the here the patient or the consumer yeah. and the thing that really didn't help was just having you know this long consent document but no element of control that completely backfired people you know were far less likely to have a test in those circumstances right even though it's digital health i like to think it's still got a relevance for how we might think about more mainstream topics in marketing Right. When you mentioned digital uh, uh, control of digital health, uh, we had the HIPAA, uh, which was designed to really give that protection. But what you're saying is that's a long list of things that doesn't pan out the way it was intended. But how do you make sure that you know the digital pri uh, in the digital world privacy is protected as well as the right care is provided at the right time? Right. So, you know, my first, I must admit, my first papers on this topic were pretty negative. Okay. Um, in that we, you know, we were looking at the effects of state privacy laws. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then we were looking at the effects about whether or not hospitals were buying up to the minute types of health technology. And then we were looking at the operations of their maternal fetal departments uh, and, you know, which tend to have the sickest babies and the most troublesome or, or high risk pregnancies. And we found, you know, we found that these electronic health systems really helped um, save babies' lives. And particularly, you know, they, they didn't help, you know, well-educated privileged people. Instead, they were helping people, you know, whose first language was not English or who were in a historically disadvantaged group, such as African Americans. And they were sort of making it all better for these groups, which, you know, it typically perhaps um, were not listened to enough, uh, you know, about their health concerns because all the data was up there and the doctors and nurses couldn't ignore it. Anyway, so that's a, it's a long speech because I'm passionate about it. But, um, you know, we did find these big positive effects of digital health um, and also for equalizing society. But we found that when you have these state privacy laws, which were, of course, intended to be helpful, but ended up being sort of very costly in terms of trying to deploy the technology, that as a result, these hospitals were not able to save as many babies' lives. And so... Because I started off in that path, I've often been worried that though we all want health privacy, we have to think better about ways of having the right health privacy laws, which don't necessarily, which can have positive effects, not these negative effects we were documenting. That's interesting because what you're saying, there are some positive effects of privacy and negative effects of privacy, particularly in a societal uh, concern or issue that we want equal access and equal benefits to everybody, this becomes a critical issue. Uh, let me add another uh, uh, layer of concern there is that you mentioned the historically disadvantaged groups. Uh, we also know that their digital access is also low. So how do you ensure that their digital access is also very high at the same time they can benefit from this? Uh, so is there some policies that uh, could be tested here? You know, it's so interesting. I um, So I think, you know, for the health privacy systems in a sense, it's the health data systems, you're forced into them, you register, you get them. But you know, what I think the pandemic has really opened up, mm -hmm. 
older literature on the digital divide. And you probably remember, like back in 2000, we were talking about the digital divide, right? It was a thing. Right. Right. And then I think everyone we knew got the internet, and so we stopped thinking about it. Right. And now in 2020, I've been going um, through some of the data in the American Community Survey, and I just realized that this is something we should have been thinking about for the last 20 years. The, you know, one of the things, um, this is, I'm going to talk about another research project, which is, you know, I don't know how we're going to make it marketing, but I think it's important, um, yeah. is, you know, I've been studying children's access to the internet. And so we're doing that. So of course, we know, <laughs> no, I can't remember. Are, are, are people in, are your kids back at school in Texas? Yes. They are, because because we have remote, where I'm living, we have remote education. And uh, but they have the choice here. You can go online or in person. Yeah. yeah, so what I've been studying is just the determination of households with children, whether or not they have the internet. And, you know, the striking racial disparities. It is so correlated with whether or not the family receives food stamps. And honestly, the, there's, a, there's, you know, a shockingly large number of, of kids who are homeless in that they don't have access to, they live in a place where there's not really access to kitchen facilities. And again, those kids, only 50% of them have any kind of regular access to the internet. And so what I'm saying is that I think we often talk in digital marketing as though internet, the internet problem is being solved. And what I think we discovered that is, not, yeah. is, oh my gosh, there is the fact that there's still that 15% who have um, what we might call more intermittent uh, internet access. access. Yeah. It's a real issue. We haven't thought, I mean, I don't know about you, but I had not thought about it for years when I was sort of doing all my digital marketing work. Well, I was aware... Uh, it, and particularly, uh, Catherine, when you look at the rest of the world, you know, there's 7.6 billion people on the planet. We're only talking about 330, 340 million people. And here, uh, the access to majority of them, even though they're getting on board through mobile devices and so on, but it's not really high speed. So the kind of uh, uh, benefits that we were, we were talking about, if they have to reach them, they definitely need to have high speed access. And it's not cheap. It is expensive now, you know, if uh, you need high speed access, you need to be able to pay more now. So that's another issue. That's why I just thought this may be something for you to think about, or you may have already thought about. So what do you think in the rest of the world? Well, you know, we've always had this horrible habit, I think, in marketing in, and I, I remember, again, we're going back a bit of time ago, but this is academic marketing, that right. if paper wasn't written in North America, right be some question about what is it telling us, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and right. these horrible things, like, you know, a student would come, you know, perhaps, you know, from India or China, and they'd have a data set, you know, which they got through their contacts back home. And then the reviewers would be like, well, it's not about North America. I know. And also, does it generalize to the rest of the world? <laughs> As if, uh, you know, this is not part of the world. But, you know. I, I hear your cynical comments that we see from the review process, but I, thankfully, I believe it's changing, although a bit slowly. But these are the kind of questions I think we need answers to as we move forward. And that brings me to the next segment, which is really, what do you see as the biggest challenges, um, you know, next five to 10 years uh, for businesses, for marketers, uh, both practitioners and researchers? And where do you see uh, we should be focusing all our energies on. Um, so I'll start with with uh, researchers, and then we'll right. move on to the general, more general world. Okay. So I think, you know, as researchers, the biggest sort of question for us is that so many of the methods that we are great at and we spent a long time learning have now been democratized. And, you right. know, anyone can download a package, use R. It's just very easy now for someone, right. uh, you know, a master's or an undergraduate to be able to do what we used to. 
And so therefore it's how to change our mindset, you know, to sort of rather to think about, well, what are they not going to do? What is it yeah. they're not going to naturally study and think about that? And so I think that's our big challenge, which is a bit of a mind shift, because as you know, we've always, it's very natural in marketing to so be very proud of our, our methods as we should be, but we yeah. should be proud that our methods are now being so widely adopted that we have, you know, cause it used to be a case that we were like, we can do quant marketing. And then, you know, the rest of the world wasn't doing it. And now the rest of the world is, what should we be doing? So that's when it comes to researchers. And then I think the sort of parallel question for firms is really, we have all these now data and methods, and that's wonderful. And marketing is so much more quantitative and data driven than it ever used to be. But are the times when we're just getting it wrong and where just using data to focus on, you know, the habitual keys on, you know, the spot under the lamppost right. rather than, you know, the entire savannah or something like that. And right. so and that's sort of more broadly, like, you know, as a managerial challenge is that what are we missing out on right now in a world where we're data driven, but naturally we're only ever going to see a certain census set of data. Oh, that's very nicely put. But, you know, one way of integrating what you're saying is that imagine that now uh, anybody could do this analysis, as you said, master's student, undergrad student. It's actually a good thing because now in practice, uh, we want more people to use the tools and uh, in such a way that it's not very, um, you know, marketing research is not considered, the research done by marketing academics is not considered really elitist or esoteric, right? So in some sense, we, it, there is a, a bridge between what the researchers used to do and what practitioners can do. But as you said, what are some of the problems that marketers should focus on, which seem to be now broader than the typical uh, problems that marketers used to focus on, which are very firm specific, the four P's decisions and so on now, uh, broadening to public policy decisions, more uh, very impactful areas, which is what you are bringing to the table. Uh, on that note, let me also ask you, so far I've been asking you all about real research and so on, but let me also help our viewers and listeners understand what Catherine Tucker as a person is and who are you? Uh, what else do you do besides research? Okay, um, <laughs> so um, I, I think it's fair to say I have maybe three main hobbies in life <laughs> or, 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 or stuff I do outside of being an MIT professor. Um, the first is just reading and rereading Pride and Prejudice. So that's quite easy. That tells me <laughs> romantic soul. Right. Um, but the second is I'm blessed enough to have four kids. And quite honestly, once you've got four kids, they're there your entire world and you've right. made decision in life that that is going to be your entire world you're not going to have a boat you're going to have four kids and so that's great that's my you know passion in life and then I guess what do I do with these four kids I make them go on wildly unsuitable vacations to places which sound quite adventurous in my head and so for example before the um the pandemic and let's be clear this sort of shows bad parenting uh, and bad decision making but we just go and try and sail around Cape Horn and we did that and we were doing that in February and just think about all the unwise you know was the pandemic was already starting I don't know what we were thinking but that's the other sort of that's the other thing we're doing as a family though obviously that's that's not happening at the moment so at the moment it's just rereading Pride and Prejudice and feeling blessed that I have four kids that is a full-time job. So I'm, I'm amazed how you can balance all of those. So we come to the last segment, Catherine, and uh, we have viewership that spans a number of different types of audiences from students to former students, to entrepreneurs, to executives, practitioners, uh, public policy people. What advice would you have to give to any or all of them uh, going forward in the future? Now that we are experiencing a pandemic, which we are not uh, sure how we are going to get out of. Um, how can uh, our audience really be thinking about the future? 
Well, you know, the way, you know, if we just take the lens of the pandemic, uh, the way I feel understand the pandemic, you know, there are obviously horrible health consequences, but, you know, in our particular field, we're going to understand an acceleration to the un in understanding about what is ultimately going to be digital, right? what it's not. And for me, it's been a really sort of, I mean, if you think about, you know, you and me doing this on Zoom, I don't think it would have right. been this, right? It's just not, it, you know, it would have been unthinkable 10 months ago. And so I think we've understood more about what aspects of our lives are right for digitization and which right. not. And that insight is going to be important for thinking, where should I focus? Where can I hope help people the most given the tools I have? So, you know, it's very broad advice, but I, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, we have, as you say, you've got a wonderful mass audience of many different interests. Right. But I think that's a good piece of advice is sit back and realize where digitization or digitalization is making a difference and absorb that and use that. And also way, find ways in which to help others and make this world or society a better place. And that is also one of our uh, slogans in here to improve the world's prosperity. So I'm glad you ended on the same slogan as we were thinking. But Catherine, it's been wonderful talking to you and thank you so much for your time and sharing your insights and your advice. And I wish you all the very best in the rest of your research as you move along. And I hope to be in touch with you, uh, with both from the Center for Retail Studies as well as the Business School as well as the University. And thank you again for participating today. Well, thank you for giving me the chance to speak. It's been lovely. Thank you again.